Bridge University professor to Dr. Trudor Partridge. Dr. Barbara has worked hand in hand with our curator, Jacqueline Goldstein, this time, and they will be doing a QA for you about the exhibition. I would just like to call up our board chair, Ira Diller, to say a few words, and I'd like to acknowledge Judy Workman and Gerald Schwartz from our, our board for attending this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, I'd like to welcome all of you. Another wonderful program at the Jewish Museum of Florida FIU. Stand in for a moment and work the yes. uh, This is going to be a most intriguing event. Two of you have done something special that's been a mission throughout your life. Thank you for the rest of the things to look at the world a bit differently. There will be so much more about it tonight. So we'll get forward to that. First thing to the museum. Thank you so much. And with that, I believe we're going to start the question. We're going to run video first. Okay. And then we'll hear from Dr. Parfit and Jack Wiggles. Thank you so much. You can stay there. You're, you're fine. The Gobadama people are a small tribe of hunter gatherers who live in the far western province of Papua New Guinea. It is one of the most unexplored places in one of the most unexplored countries in the world. The story the Gobadama tell of their origins begins with their ancestors' long journey by canoe to a scattering of lush islands set in this tropical lagoon. Thousands of years later, the Gogodala are still here, still mostly hunter-gatherers, still using canoes as their means of transportation around the lagoon, still cut off from the rest of the world. Now they are making an extraordinary claim that has attracted the attention of scholars and religious groups from around the world. The Gobadala say they are one of the lost tribes of Israel. They say the Jewish holy book, the Torah, is their story. And after thousands of years they have eaten all to themselves, the Gobadala now say they want to go home to Israel. Studies professor Tudor Parker is an expert on lost Jewish tribes. In March 2013, he took his third trip to Papua New Guinea to visit the Gogodala. To Professor Parker, the Gogodala's claim to an Israeli ancestry is actually part of a worldwide phenomenon tied to colonialism and the influence of Christian missionaries. In religious studies, we talk about secretism which is the way in which different uh, religious traditions can come together and form a new sort of religious uh, entity. And this is what we have here. Um, the bedrock of the Jews, the religious identity of the Gogodala, remains in some respects and traditional belief system that the community can build Christianity, which was introduced to this previous Calvinistic tribe in the 1950s. Uh, on top of that, we draw a kind of uh, Judaism. So it's interesting to see that uh, many of them were Yakutus, and uh, they recently acquired crash news. They started uh, celebrating quite specifically Jewish holidays, like Passover, for instance, in the coming 
The Gokodoma say they have always been Jews. In fact, their original ancestors, they say, came from Jerusalem. And our ancestors believe uh, they passed on the story of the they traveled, traveled in the Kenyans. The Kenyans came from a place called Yemisa. And we believe that uh, Yemisa is, uh, is in Israel, which is uh, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is that. Because at that time, that place was still known as Jerusalem. And uh, that's our our consciousness and our forefathers told us that that's our homeland. And uh, <coughs> we will return one day to that place. That is the inner words. A traditional dance of the Gokadala relates the story of their exodus from Israel and predicts their eventual return. We are praying that uh, the Lord's uh, word will be fulfilled to us when it says in the Bible, when uh, Yeshua's coming, before he comes, all, like, all his people, his chosen people, will go back to Israel. So <coughs> The Gokodala claim to be Jewish has not been validated. Initial DNA tests by Professor Harvard proved inconclusive. For now, life on the lagoon continues as it always has. And it remains to be seen whether these young Gokodala will be as fervent as their parents to trade their Eden for Israel. Professor Parker, there's a microphone for you. Before we start, I should just say about that film that what should have been said was that there were six or seven FIV students who were on that trip. And um, we kind of landed in the middle of the um, clearing in the, in the jungle in western Papua New Guinea. And we were there for a week and um, somehow managed to get them back safely to FIU and they carried on with their career. Anyway. Well, let's go. We're going to go back to the beginning. Um, was there anything in your Welsh Christian background? Well, I was just saying to somebody on the January the 10th, I was told by a doctor in London that I had two weeks to live. And it was a bit of a misdiagnosis. And I went home, and my son was there, and um, I said, Sebastian, I've got some bad news. I've only got two more weeks to live. And he said, Well, Dad, I think you better start on your autobiography straight away. And um, as it happens, that was supposed to be funny. I mean, if you want to. So recently I've been thinking about the ways in which um, Wales, which is a, it's a very peculiar place, and I think it's all been a fairly peculiar place, might have, how it might have impacted on my uh, decision to spend my life in the way that I have. And uh, just like every uh, village in Wales has got a chapel or a church, uh, which has a Hebrew name, it's going to be something like Bethel or Jerusalem or some Hebrew tabernacle or something like that. Uh, Kabbel, uh, the Hebrew men, the Jewish men. And so this was always kind of a little bit in the background in my 
family. We didn't actually know any Jews. There weren't any Jews in the part of England where we lived. Um, but kind of by chance, um, you know, when I was a um, little bit older, I, I found myself in Israel. And uh, in the meantime, I don't really think that the Welsh thing was terribly important. But now that I am doing my uh, uh, sort of a kind of, it's not really an autobiography, it's a sort of autobiography. I am going to be talking a lot about the connections between one small country, Wales, and another small country, um, Israel, uh, which are very similar. Uh, both the Welsh and the Jews over time oppressed uh, people. Um, the, the Jews have been oppressed by everybody. The Welsh have been oppressed uh, mainly by the English. Yeah. Yes, I can't. Well, I can, I can say something. The, I mean, the interesting thing is this, that um, in terms of lost tribe law, I mean, if you read on kind of stuff about people that claim to be, you know, a lost tribe in Israel. The Welsh very often figure, and most of this kind of figuring of the Welsh, all the Danish, or British, or various other Western European states, came through an organization that really started at the end of the 18th century, uh, which was called the British Israelite and that, in a way, was simply a mechanism to somehow give religious justification to the fact that the British ruled the world. You know, the idea that the British themselves were lost tribe somehow validated the incredible power and the incredible uh, reach of the empire throughout this period of the 18th and the 19th. Um, century. So I always thought, kind of thought that the Welsh thing to do with lost tribes was somehow connected with that. But um, during the, the weeks in January, where, where I was kind of researching the, this Welsh background of mine, I discovered <laughs> that the Welsh texts going back a thousand years. Um, I should just say that it's um, the Welsh is the um, in terms of European languages, it's the one with the longest um, uh, continuous literature. Um, we don't count Hebrew, which otherwise wouldn't be, I suppose. I don't think it quite counts as a European language. But um, anyway, even this way, you've got um, two literatures, two languages with incredibly ancient um, uh, you know, sort of literary traditions. And so I discovered that even a thousand years ago, when the Welsh made the same claim. So that is the answer to your question. All right. Um, so to the Peace Corps in Israel, are they seen? Yes. Well, there's something called VSO, which is Voluntary Service Overseas. It was founded in about 1958 by a remarkable man called um, Alec Dixon. And it was from Alec Dixon's idea of sending volunteers to former colonies, or actually in 1958 existing colonies, that the American Peace Corps um, got the, uh, I think, the initial spark. Anyway, it was very different from the Peace Corps because the Peace Corps had jeeps and they were very well paid and VSO didn't have jeeps, and they were very poorly paid. And um, I, as it happened, was sent to uh, Jerusalem. I was working in an institution um, just outside Jerusalem, the way to the Hadassah Hospital. Um, and uh, the institution I was working in was very mixed. It had uh, some very, very handicapped intellectually handicapped, mentally handicapped kids. Others were less so uh, physically handicapped. Many of them were given concentration camps. And um, while I was there, I did a variety of tasks, uh, which didn't really impact much upon the rest of my life. Um, 
But one of the jobs that I did there was to accompany the, the social worker every week and we'd go to some different place in Israel and visit the um, parents of the children or the young people who were in the institution. So I met people from Kurdistan and from Iraq and from Yemen and from all of the Jewish diaspora. And that was really a kind of turning point in my life. I thought this was the most incredible thing that um, after thousands of years, um, these people were trickling back uh, to what they considered to be their homeland. I thought it was a, it was a majestic idea, a remarkable idea. And uh, when I went back to England, instead of um, uh, studying history, which is what I was supposed to do at Oxford, I changed almost immediately to, to Hebrew and Arabic. And from then on, my doom was sealed. Did you say that you switched gears for the metro traveler, or did you say that you didn't join offsides with that? And what made you switch? Why? Was it ever the case switch? Well, yes, it's, it, that's a good, a good question. Um, I haven't really been, I must admit, a very um, conventional scholar, uh, or put it like this. I, I was a conventional scholar for the first 10, 12 years of my career. And, um, you know, I was producing a couple of articles every year. You know, I was fairly uh, studious and I um, was getting on with it. But the number of people who read those articles was minuscule. So, um, you know, so I think I was yearning for a slightly, um, a slightly larger kind of audience. And, um, but then, uh, but I think that um, this is quite a number of years down the line. Um, I was asked to go to Ethiopia. Uh, luckily, I was asked to go to the Sudan. And um, rumors have got to uh, London that um, uh, Ethiopian Jews were being poisoned by Christians in the, uh, in the refugee camps along the border between Ethiopia and the Sudan. This was the time, 1984, the Great uh, Famine. And so Minority Rights Group, which is a London-based um, organization, asked me to go and write a report on the uh, of what was happening essentially to the Ethiopian Jews in, in the Sudan. And I turned up, um, flew to Khartoum, and then took a bus to a place called Kadarov and wandered around a little bit and um, followed a path up into Ethiopia for, for a while and saw these Ethiopian Jews um, stumbling down these kind of stony tracks and um, the most incredible dreadful stories of, of being attacked and raped and uh, so on and so forth. And on one occasion, I was, this time I was on the Sudanese side, and um, there was a two-story kind of hut um, with a kind of palisade around it and a little tower. It wasn't exactly an impressive building, but it was the most impressive building in that um, compound of uh, um, refugee camps. And um, a group of Ethiopian Jews arrived and they flung themselves on the floor and started weeping and uh, rejoicing at the same time. And they said through, uh, through an interpreter, we've arrived at Jerusalem and we are thrilled of it. And the words uh, to that attack. And that was kind of moving that they thought this was Jerusalem. They really had no idea which direction they were going, but, but that's where they wanted to get to. And um, um, I think it was the day after that that I saw some people wandering down the main street of the, uh, or the main track of 
where the tree can. And um, they were speaking Hebrew, and I thought, well, that's very odd. And, uh, and then I saw some uh, Ethiopian Jews getting into trucks and driving off with these very same people who were speaking Hebrew. And gradually I realized that the, the Israelis were involved in a, an operation, a secret operation, and I was the only person to be observing it. So I thought probably the best thing for me to do was to get out of the way. And so I went to, um, I went back to uh, Khartoum, went to the um, Grand Hotel, went straight to the bar, hoping to get a drink, and um, failed in that uh, mission and because there wasn't any drink. Um, but at the bar, there was uh, somebody else, an Englishman, and he also had been an Orientalist and it's Oxford. And so we started chatting, and I, he said, What are you doing here? And I told him. And his face went kind of pale. And um, he explained that um, eventually he was the Mossad operative who was overseeing what was subsequently called Operation Moses. Um, I could be, well, he said, listen, this is ultra secret. You can't talk about it. You can't write about it. You can't do anything about it because it would cost lives or something like that. He said, if you, you know, if you trust me, if you close up asking, as soon as it's possible uh, for me to tell you what's actually going on here, I will tell you. And um, so a few months later, um, the Operation Moses story was the headline in every newspaper in the world, pretty much. And the um, following day, the sky I can't tell you today, he, um, he called me from Jerusalem and said, I'm coming over to London and I'm going to tell you the story, and tell me the story. And then Lord Whitefield, who was already my publisher, said, You've got to write a book about Operation Moses. And that was the point at which I stopped being a kind of 100% academic and started being a kind of journalist, popular writer. And that night, um, uh, well, the night that I handed the manuscript in, or the height of the night, perhaps the book came out, which was only about two months after the story. Um, somebody said, You've got to decide who you are. You know, what are you? Are you an academic? Or are you a kind of venturer, you know, journalist? So I made the decision. And I said, No, I don't. Um, I'm going to play my career according to my rules. And um, so, I do one academic book and then I would do uh, a popular book. And I, in any event, and this I think is one of the points of this exhibition, uh, it, you know, as we were working on it, I kept saying, you know, that um, I'd like to be able to show some how that in, even in the 21st century, that a, a journey can be a really important tool of, um, of an academic. That just by traveling from A to B, you can learn stuff that you wouldn't be able to learn in any other way. And I think that um, I think that the uh, I think that the exhibition demonstrates that if you follow it closely. Exactly. Um, the thirteenth gate. I have a strong feeling that this book is going to be well, this was my, the 13th gate is, um, it, it's a very nice, uh, it's a very nice title and the idea of the title was, uh, there was a specific rabbi and uh, he said around the city of Jerusalem there are 13 gates, so 12 of the gates uh, were for the 12 tribes and the 13th gate was for he who did not know to which tribe he belonged. And I thought that was an amazingly interesting metaphor. And as I got older and more knowledgeable about the various groups in the world that um, yearned to be Jewish, it seemed to be a superb uh, kind of uh, uh, symbolic way of thinking about them, people who are lost, and people whose background in some ways ambiguous people kind of seeking uh, a new identity, sometimes simply an identity. 
So this journey was a long time ago, and I didn't really have those ideas then, but I, I went to Syria, and um, this was at a time when there was still Jews there, and I was, um, uh, I was um, um, captured by the Muslim Iran, because I was wandering around the place that I should be wandering around, I was imprisoned and threatened with um, some slightly unpleasant um, tortures, which really rather, rather disagreeable, I wrote about that in a book, and then I carried on, it was a kind of world, you know, it was a trip around the world visiting weird Jew Jewish communities in different places, only weird in the sense that I didn't know anything about them. And so I went to um, Singapore, and subsequently I wrote a book about the Jews in Singapore, not on this trip. And, um, and then um, Japan, and I see that my dear friend from the department, who is one of the world's great experts on um, Japan, is sitting on the third row. And um, I think in our very, very first conversation, we had a conversation about the various um, Japanese uh, groups who have a belief, um, like so many other people in the world, that um, they're descended from the last tribe. So the reason, anyway, that, um, I didn't talk about the, these journeys in the, uh, in the exhibition is that all the material is elsewhere. <laughs> There was nothing more, uh, nothing more than that. And I don't, I don't, don't actually have any photographs. You know, in those days, how often did you have that option? No, I have to section in the, in the show, uh, Man, Dave, and it's describe it. Yes, so there's, there's one plaque which is called the Mandate, Mandate. And so, what happened was this, after writing the book on the Ethiopian Jews, this was my first experience, the first experience of Africa. And it was my first connection with the Lost Tribes. As it happens, the Ethiopian Jews are reckoned to be the Lost Tribe of Dan. I didn't think personally about the Lost Tribe of Dan, but they're reckoned to be the Lost Tribe of Dan. And um, one of my students, and they are former students, he's now a PhD, a very eminent uh, rabbi, is nodding his head as I'm saying this. I'm not sure if he's agreeing with me or not. <laughs> but he will tell me afterwards, I dare say. And um, so after, the, after writing this book, I was invited to go to South Africa to give um, a talk. And it was a group like this, it was mainly a uh, probably exclusive to the Jewish people, quite um, prosperous and well-heeled. And um, at the back of the room um, where the lecture was going on, there was a group of ragged um, African, uh, black African people who were shoeless and uh, wearing yarmulkes. And at the end of the lecture, they came over to see me and they said that they were lost track of this room as well. And I must have looked pretty skeptical. And they looked a little hurt and they said, please come with us, come and spend a weekend with us, spend a week with us, you'll soon see that we really are um, a lost tribe and that we really are Jews. We may not look like these other people, but we really are Jews. So I went um, up to the border between Mozambique and, um, and South Africa in the northeast corner and spent a few days looking at how these people did things. And it did seem to be sort of Semitic in many ways. And in any event, the story that they told me was so kind of intriguing and, and so exciting that um, I was hooked. And so the story essentially was this. They said, well, we don't really know where we came from, but we come from a place called Senna. And this was probably a thousand or fifty hundred years ago. And um, when we left Senna, we crossed the sailor, but we don't know what the sailor is. And then we came to Africa and we rebuilt Senna. And, and then we, uh, very foolishly, we broke the law of God and we started eating mice. And uh, this was against the law. And so as a result, God scattered us among the nations. So now we're all over the place in Africa. They said, but we have an oral tradition, very precise, uh, which tells us the way that we came. And if you follow 
of the formal tradition, rather like the Australian song lines, you will be able to get from here in Soweto, South Africa, you'll be able to find Senna where we originally came from. And they were convinced that Senna had something to do with uh, Israel. The um, spiritual leader of the of this tribe called the Lemba was a man called Professor Matiba, who actually studied at my very own uh, universities for the Oriental African Studies in London. And he said to me, uh, I want you to follow Senna. And um, I said, well, why me? He said, because you know, English have always been explored. We're not explored exactly. But you'll be able to do it. And while you're at it, um, if you could also find uh, something that we believe is the last of the covenant, then we would be doubly joyous. So I went back to the um, to my dear old um, uh, publisher in London, told him this um, primitive story, and he gave me an adequately generous um, sum of money. Uh, to go and write a book, and, um, and so off I um, went. And the mission essentially was to find seven, and eventually, after quite a number of years, I did find seven. The Princess took the journey to Lost City, uh, successfully won a literary prize. Um, do, you become, do you want to become an leave academia and become a full-time writer, stay in academia and yeah. add that to your journeys. That was the point really at which the book did very well, the, the journey to the lost city. And uh, it, yes, it did, you know, win some literary prizes and um, it was very flattering comparisons made between me and some of my heroes in the literary sphere. And I was kind of uh, tempted, but uh, most of my life has been devoted to paying for school fees. Uh, I wasn't really sure that, um, you know, simply working as a writer uh, was um, going to, uh, was quite going to work in that, in that particular sense. But I was very, very tempted, and um, a colleague of mine at the university, who was also, also an orientalist, uh, she had the same dilemma, um, and you know, she wanted to be a novelist, and she started writing novels, and you know, she was a professor at Acadian, and she was spending more and more time on the novels and less and less time on the Acadian, and finally she resigned and um, went and wrote her novels. The only difference between her and me was that um, her family owned, and I'm not joking, about half of Wales. So uh, she could afford to be noble and to be principled. In Germany, you said you took two different styles, all the traditions and DNA. But how are the journeys different besides subject matter, as far as travel? Well, in the middle of my career, <clears throat> um, you know, genetics, um, the study of um, genetics developed to a point where it became a usable tool for anthropologists and for uh, historians. So in my particular case, I've got my mission, I've got my mandate, I've got to cross Africa, I've got to find Senna, I've got to prove also if these people who claim to be Jewish are really Jewish. So I follow their song lines. I follow them you know, from village to village to village. I'm traveling for five or six months and um, following it very, very closely, taking, taking notes, and, you know, really forming a very precise idea of where they came from, what sort of customs they had. And, um, you know, every encounter led me to the next. And so after, I don't know, three or four months, I 
on the edge of Africa and on the Indian Ocean. And, you know, that's a point at which there are no more clues, there are no more people to speak to at sea, but fish, you know, what we say. And um, so, you know, I'm kind of stuck. And I kind of take off on a half-hearted, you know, journey of Dow, one of these Arab um, single sail boats, but we don't go very far in two or three days, and we get back, it's hopeless, it's over, it's the end of the thing. I've kind of failed in my mission. So I write the book with this, I write a kind of poetic um, ending to the book, um, and it actually worked really well. In terms of my original mission, I have I could solve the problem. And so it was actually several years later that I'm um, now writing an academic book about the history of the Jews in Yemen, in the Yemen. And um, so I go down the Wadi Hadramant, and, um, which is the most extraordinary place in the world. I love the Wadi Hadramant. It's, the, it's a valley that goes through the empty port of the great desert of um, South Arabia. And um, I'm speaking to a Muslim in um, one of the holy cities of the Hadramant, and he invites me for lunch, and a um, very charming man. And, uh, he said, well, what do you work on? I said, well, I'm a Hebrew and the Jewish history is uh, wonderful. They're very wonderful people, the Jews, and I'd love to learn Hebrew myself. I had a very amicable conversation. And then he told me the story about the temple of my mission, Senna, the sailor, you know, the fact that I don't found it. And he said, well, actually, at the end of the one year, if you go, I mean, have to pass the, the place where the road stops, but eventually you'll get to a, um, a, a ruined city which is set up. And um, this place, we believe, was destroyed uh, about a thousand years ago. According to tradition, the people left and they went to Africa. So I traveled down this, uh, this, this wadi for a few days, eventually got to the place that he described. And there were some people living there, and, um, and no signs, you know, nothing that said, hey, and we were here, we went to Africa, you know, indications really one way or the other. But I thought it might be worth, um, at some point anyway, uh, doing a DNA test between that place and the place from which the land came in, in Africa. So I ran back. Uh, a few months later with um, some geneticists who did a, a, a genetic um, study of the whole of the Hadramant, taking hundreds and hundreds of samples. And then we went back to um, uh, South Africa and did neighboring populations as well as the leper. It's a massive study and it was published in Nature. And what it showed was that um, there was absolute, an absolute overlap between the, this population from the eastern end of the Hadera and the, um, the so-called Jews in Central Africa. And in addition to this pretty good evidence, um, there was also uh, the fact that the tribal names at the eastern end of the Hadera were identical to the tribal names of the, of the Lemba. So this was looking um, pretty, pretty good. So, in this particular case, a journey that was essentially um, looking for oral traditions and trying to get conventional evidence uh, turned into a journey that was looking for new evidence through DNA. And this is new. This is the first time in history that this has been possible. And I was incredibly privileged to be part of the first wave of historians who can use DNA for these purposes. But it's, it's not really that different in a sense because, um, you know, DNA is simply, uh, and of course in the future it will become even more so, it's simply a history book that we all carry around with us. And, you know, 20 years ago when we were doing this stuff, it was still very, very difficult and very, very expensive to read the book. Now it's very easy to read the book and anybody can read the book. And so it really amounts to the same thing in addition to it. Uh, when you're doing a DNA study, you have to take 
all kinds of information about the individuals concerned. So you, you meet a lot of people and you find out a lot of information in a way that you probably wouldn't if you're doing a kind of qualitative uh, research project, which is what I normally had in the past. So on one occasion, so this is, you know, radical Islam uh, in the middle of um, the Handramat, very, very pious, most very suspicious about, about foreigners. And it was getting a little bit difficult to, you know, get as much data as we wanted. So I had the bright idea of going to a college, a college there, a teacher's training college. I spoke to the, um, to the headmaster, to the director of the college, and explained our mission. He said, not political, to go over the responded. He said, um, okay, you can go and ask them if they want to participate. So in my um, Oxford Arabic, I asked them if they would like to um, participate in this genetic project and um, very helpful to us. And, um, we shared the results with them and so on. And um, so somebody stood up and said, it says very clearly in the Quran that uh, Muslims should not participate in any way with um, genetic studies. And so they all stood up and walked out. I was pretty dubious to be honest that the Quran says any such thing. But um, one brave soul stayed behind and I had a Polaroid camera and uh, so he gave his DNA and then I took a photograph of him with a Polaroid camera and uh, he had this lovely colour photograph of himself and he went out into the yard, waved this, you know, in, in the face of his friends and two minutes later we had 49 students absolutely dying to show their DNA from the outside world. Yeah. I have to say, I was afraid and it's my uh, best impression for the night, but when I first started with the Beyonce, I read this article in Boston Journal, 1998, British Indian Jones. Very funny article. I this my, you know, when I first heard of your name. So, tell me about that article. Well, that, or even better, because that's a very fun, It's a very, very funny article. Somehow, the Wall Street Journal journalist was wandering around Western India when I was doing some DNA studies with a colleague of mine and he wrote this uh, slightly sarcastic but um, quite funny uh, article about what we were trying to prove and in this particular case it's a group called the Panay Israel who um, had always been rather despised by other Jews in India and nobody believed they were Jewish so we did this DNA project and uh, to everybody's astonishment and surprise, um, you know, according to you know, the various criteria that we had at the time, they seemed to be as Jewish as anybody else. And so there was great, um, great um, rejoicing. But anyway, the, the moniker kind of stuck. And um, so uh, for good or for bad, and so I became the British Indiana Jones. Exactly how you were saying. Ah, I do have part of the British Indian Economics Committee. We do have, we are open for questions. Where's the microphone? It's not working. Oh, it's not working. So we're not allowed to question. Well, we will. Let me get back. Does anybody have a question? First of all, first, yeah. Thank you. Try it with us. This is for us. I have a question. Hey, Tudor, is it possible for me to visit uh, the Gogodala? Is that feasible? Oh, somebody's asking here on, 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 uh, yeah, he knows me. <laughs> Shep? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Tudor. Someone is asking you a question. Uh, is it possible for me, for example, with another Kulanu friend to go to Papua New Guinea and, finish, and visit the Gogodala? Did you hear me ask if it's possible, it possible to for him to go and visit the Gokodala and Papua New Guinea? Yes, there's no reason at all. Uh, they'd be delighted That's to see you and um, 
uh, please get in touch with me. And, um, yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah. Super. People there. They've got emails. And, uh, there, there goes by. What what time of year is best? What time of year is best? What time of year? I think any time of year is equally horrible. Ask your question. What's your name? Hi, I'm Vicky. I'm a student of Dr. Parker's. And my question is. I was just interested to see if, uh, how did you end up at FIU? You know, it's kind of just like you were now at FIU. Yeah, how did you end up at FIU? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to say well, it was a very, very good thing that happened to me to come to FIU. And um, it was. Entirely unexpected. I um, I retired from the School of Oriental African Studies in England. They kick you out when you get to 65. And um, almost the next day, I had a telephone call from uh, somebody in, in Miami, uh, somebody with whom I'd worked in the past. And um, it was just at the point at which the Jewish Museum here had been acquired by. I'd actually been to FIU once or twice before to give a lecture. So I kind of knew it and I liked it. And um, so I was asked to apply for a job and um, I was very fortunate and I got the job. And I've had 10 fabulous years and, um, under the leadership of our revered president, I'm delighted that he's here. The light has always been incredibly kind to me and very helpful. And, and the museum uh, as well. It's been 10 fantastic years, amazing students, great colleagues, and I'm much, much happier here than I ever was at SARS. And I hope to be able to stay here for at least another 10 years. Any other questions? Well, I, I don't want to unplug the microphone, but actually, to one comment and one question. So I would love you to expound, expound a bit more on the lost art and the one that you did find and what do you think about that? There. Well, the lost art story of the member was um, extraordinarily intriguing. First of all, the tradition that they had was um, it was not the result, I'm quite certain, it was not the result of a reinterpretation of the Bible. So the place that they lived in Zimbabwe was not a place that had any contact, as far as we know, with outside people um, for a thousand, two thousand years. And they had this tradition, which was basically the tradition was that they had um, an object which they had brought from the north that was carried by priests and which did the same sorts of things as the art, which is to say that they would carry it into battle and um, it would kill people, it would explode and lights would, and flames would flash in all directions, um, sacred objects would be carried within the art. And all of these things are precisely the things that the Ark of the Covenant, according to the Hebrew Bible, is supposed to do. So it was pretty intriguing. And so I was asked to find this, um, this thing, and eventually I did. And um, we had a radio carbon test at the uh, um, archaeology department at Oxford. And it turns out to be about 1200, obviously it's much uh, younger than the Ark of the Covenant, but still it's the oldest um, wooden object ever found in sub Saharan Africa. And it has this intriguing um, story that goes uh, along with it. So when I wrote, I knew a lot of this when I wrote the um, journey to the Banished City, I never mentioned it. 
I did make a couple of lines, but I didn't make a big deal of this story. But when we started doing the DNA work, things changed. I'll tell you why. One of the things that we discovered was that um, Jewish priests, um, people um, called Kohl, yeah? um, we did a DNA study on these uh, Kohl and uh, we discovered that 52% of the people that we took DNA from um, had a particular uh, genetic uh, signature which came to be known and is still known as the colon modal haplotype. Well, this was pretty impressive kind of research. What is kind of saying, and who would have thought it, that these guys called Cohen wandering around saying, yes, for the priesthood and so on. Oh, and I should just explain for anybody here who doesn't know that. The, this was a white chromosome study, so white chromosome works in such a way that uh, you, you have it from your father and has it from his father and has it from his father a thousand generations back, but it doesn't change. And the status of the, of the priesthood works exactly the same way. That you're a priest because your dad's a priest, and he's a priest because his dad's a priest. And that's the only way that you can be a priest. And that was the original idea. Wouldn't it be fun to do a DNA study and see if there's anything, you know, happening here? And indeed there was. And so this was a massive big story and so on. So when we were doing the um, DNA study of the member, lo and behold, what do we discover? We discover that the priestly tribe or the priestly clan within the member tribe has this very signature. So this very priestly signature is held by them. And so that really, to be honest, was the point at which I thought, well, hang on. Um, if we have now, uh, on top of all of the other kind of similarity evidence and ancient tradition evidence, uh, well, you've also got this kind of evidence which suggests that these guys who claim to have carried this object from, uh, from Israel at some point in the north years ago, um, you know, uh, actually related to the uh, priests who once officiated in the temple in Jerusalem. So I thought that was intriguing, and I'm going to say more than that. Of course, the thing is only 800 years old, it's not very old in biblical terms, but the tradition of the letter is that um, at a point in history, a thousand years ago or something, the Magog, uh, it's called the Magog of Ubuntu, exploded and a new one was built using a little bit of the original one as the core of the new one. And that makes sense as well. Um, not that I really believe, I do not believe that it is the Ark of the Covenant, but I believe it's something very similar to the Ark of the Covenant, and I believe their story. So, so if they were calling me, were they able to do the doctor's spot? How many people can do that? He was a Kohen silver. Well, it's true enough. That's a test that I never. Um, did you do any other DNA tests? Did you do any other DNA tests on any of the groups like the Gondar Jews or the Beta Israel Jews? Yes, I did several groups. Um, so, in the case of the Benezra, I mentioned them, and the evidence was that despite the fact that for a couple of hundred years people have been saying they weren't Jewish and they had nothing to do with the Jews, the DNA evidence showed that they did. So, that was a positive result. And it was weird. 
This was um, in Western India. And then we did one in South India. And in South India, you've got a white Jewish population, which is very ancient and very well known, and which was in contact with uh, Egypt and other places. And then um, you had black Jews living there who were supposed to be um, uh, the descendants of um, slaves who converted to Judaism. And once again, these people weren't allowed to sit on the benches in the synagogue in Koshi. They had to sit on the floor and they were thoroughly despised. They were out of you don't have to spend your time with these people. They're not really Jews at all, they state. And so we did a DNA test with them, and lo and behold, they also had a kind of profile which indicated that um, you know their ancestors, at least some of their ancestors, came um, from the Middle East and the Jews. And so that was a positive one. And then there was another group with the name Manashe, and you see the name Manashe wandering all over Israel these days, there are thousands of them there, and they're kind of Burmese looking. And I've been interested in them since um, 1984, I wrote about them. I think I was the first person to write about them, as a matter of fact. And I did a, um, you know, a research project on them, and there's absolutely no um, similarity at all. And I fully understand why I've written about that as well. And um, so that was another group. And then, um, one day I was in, um, in um, Sydney, I'd been invited to give a lecture at the University of Sydney. And this was, um, you know, the notices were put in the newspaper and so on and so forth. And a couple of days later, I got um, a telephone call at my hotel from somebody who said he was the spiritual head of the uh, Ogodon tribe um, in Papua New Guinea. Um, so I did a little Google search and discovered that this was a formerly cannibalistic tribe. And uh, the gentleman went on to say that um, they were the lost tribe of Israel. We saw a little bit of the film at the beginning of the program. And that he was going to come and visit me the following day. He was flying down from the path when we get into Australia. So the following day, the Front desk called up, you've got a visitor, would you like to come down? And went down. And there's this chap um, from Papua New Guinea, and he had in front of him a big black hat, a kind of borsalino hat. And he presented it to me and he said, If you look inside this hat, you'll see that there are 56 strands of hair which I personally have plucked from the head of my tribesman. And I want you to take these hairs back with you to London, and you'll be able to prove to the world what we say about ourselves is true, that we indeed are a lost tribe of Israel. So it seems to be a fairly fantastic tale, but who could resist such a tale? And so um, the following year, I went back and um, I went um, three times altogether and went to their. Uh, Jungle um, uh, hangouts, which was a um, um, place called the Limo, on, on the, uh, right in the middle of the jungle, with no roads that go there, there are no boats that go there, and the only thing that can go there is a um, kind of military aircraft or helicopter. And so I went in one of these um, uh, aircraft and they landed in a sort of field uh, next to the village. and. Um, if you listen closely to the text of the little film, um, you'll have heard the narrator saying that Parfit um, found that the results were indeterminate. That's not strictly speaking true. I have to share with you. Um, the results clearly indicated that they were no such thing. They were simply people from Papua New Guinea. Um, however, when I first made the um, revelation, which I was bound by academic um, convention to do, um, I was surrounded by about 150 heavily armed tribesmen 
were desperately anxious for the results to be positive. So, yes, there we are. I'm so glad we told that story because that is one of my favorite of your many fascinating stories. And I want to thank you so much for sharing them with us tonight and for sharing all your photographs and many things you've collected over the years. And I want to thank all of you for actually coming in person to the museum to visit us tonight and to listen to Jack and Bill speak and talk. I want to remind you that we still have our graduates. And still time to see the exhibit and our fabulous gift shop is open. Thank you all. Thank you. Wow.